Hey, what's up guys? Vigilant Texan here. Today I would like to share something with you called Swear an Oath or Let Your Yes Be Yes. Um, that's a phrase you hear in scripture more than once is let your yes be yes. Today we're going to take a look at the act of oath swearing, swearing an oath or a vow, um, what it means to take a solemn oath or a divine oath, <clears throat> and just kind of look at the, the topic um, everything that it encompasses so first I'd like to take a look at what popular basically opinion of our time today believes about it so let's go look at what Wikipedia says because it, it's always good to I think to to just start with a what is well what does everyone else think you know what is popular opinion and so Wikipedia says traditionally an oath also called a plight or the act of swearing in or getting sworn in is either a statement of fact or a promise with wording re relating to something considered sacred or a sign of verity. A common legal substitute for those who conscientiously object to making a sacred oath is to give an affirmation instead. Nowadays, even when there is no notion of sanctity involved, certain promises said out loud in a ceremony or judicial purpose are referred to as oaths. To swear is a verb used to describe the taking of an oath to making a solemn vow okay we are actually also going to be speaking of what's called a divine oath so I think we should read the definition of that as well so according to Wikipedia a divine oath is usually oaths that have oaths that have referred to a deity are significant in the culture sphere in question the reciter's personal views upon the divinity of the accents considered sacred in a predicated text of an oath may or may not be taken into account. There might not be al alternative personal proclamations with no mention of the sacred dogma in question, such as affirmations to be made. That This might mean an impasse to those who are unwilling to edify the dogma they see as untrue and those who decline to refer to sacred matters on the subject at hand. The essence of a divine oath is an invocation of divine agency to be a guarantor, a guarantor of the oath taker's own honesty and integrity in the matter under question. By implication, this involves divine displeasure if the oath taker fails in the sworn duties. It therefore implies greater care than usual in the act of performance of one's duty, such as in a testimony to the facts of the matter in a court of law. So, just to sum that up, basically the divine oath would mean a lot to the person if they truly believe in that divinity but at the same time it could also mean that it's not valid to someone who doesn't also believe in that divinity which makes sense but in its essence would be to give some extra agency or guarantor that it might be a real oath of integrity and not just a, like a, an oath without that divine uh, authorship and it goes on to say a person taking an oath indicates that indicates this in a number of ways. The most usual is the explicit I swear, but any statement or promise that includes with as my witness or so help me with being something or someone the oath taker holds sacred is an oath. Many people take an oath by holding in their hand or placing over their head a book or scripture or a sacred object, this indicating the sacred witness through their action. Such an oath is called corporal, however, the chief purpose of such an act is for ceremony or solemnity, and the act does not on itself make the oath. Here's a, an interesting graphic I found that says an oath, an invocation of the divine name as witness to the truth, um, assertory oath, God is called on as a witness to the truth, or a promissory oath, calling on God to witness to what you intend to do in the future promissory mean I'm promising that this is going to take place in the future now what I'd like to do is take a look at the um, places in scripture where this is discussed obviously it's very important so the place that it's most very that it's very clear I believe is numbers chapter 30 so let's take a look over there starting with verse 1 it says and Moses spoke to the heads of the tribes concerning the children of Yasharel, saying, This is the word which Yahuwah has commanded. 
When a man vows a vow to Yahuwah or swears an oath to bind himself by some agreement, he does not break his word. He does according to all that comes out of his mouth. Period. So there's your rule. There's your, your law. It, when, you, when you vow a vow and you swear it, and you swear it on Yah's name, then you must do it. You must not break your word and you must do all that comes out of your mouth. Okay, so there's the law. It, when you take an oath or a vow, you have to do it. Then it says, or if a woman vows a vow to Yahuwah and binds herself by some agreement, but while she's in her father's house in her youth and her father hears her vow in the agreement by which she's bound herself and her father has kept silent towards her, then all her vows shall stand and every agreement which she has bound herself stands. But if her father forbids her on, that, on the day that he hears it, and none of her vows nor agreements by which she is bound herself stands. So he can disannul it if he hears it, and disannuls it the day that he hears it. And Yahweh pardons her because her father has forbidden her, but if she at all belongs to a husband while bound by her vows of rash utterance from her lips for which she is bound herself, and her husband hears it, and he is kept silent on her, then her vows shall stand, same thing, and if the agreements by which she bound herself do stand, but if her husband forbids her on the day that he hears it, and then he nullifies her vow which she vowed, and the rash utterance of her lips which she has bound herself, and Yahweh pardons her. So, we get the same rule, we get, we get the, the rule about the vows, but then also the, the make sure that you know that if it's a woman, she can be released from her vows by her covering her husband so now we're going to just look at some of the other places it talks about it um, in Deuteronomy chapter 6 right after the Shema we, we get uh, uh, in verse 13 it says fear Yahweh your Elohim and serve him and swear by his name so there we're commanded to fear him and to swear by his name alright then over in Leviticus chapter 5 starting in verse 4 it says or when a being swears, speaking rashly with his lips to do evil or to do good, whatever it is that a man swears rashly with an oath, it has been hidden from him, when he shall know it. Then he shall be guilty of one of these, and it shall be when he is guilty of one of these that he shall confess that in which he has sinned. So here, they're going back. He's going back in and putting a little disclaimer that says, if you didn't know that what you are swearing. <coughs> <coughs> was going to get you in trouble that as soon as you find out you, at that point when you do know you're then guilty of it and you must confess it this is a little more clarification then later in Leviticus 19 we have a warning it says and do not swear falsely by my name that's the you know Yahuwah and so profane the name of your Elohim I am Yahuwah so not only are we told that we should fear him and swear by his name. But it says, do not swear falsely by his name because you will then profane the name. So that's good to know that if you did swear and you didn't come through with it, that that would be taking his name and profaning it, which would then be breaking one of the, the Ten Commandments. So the next scripture I'd like to look at is from Hosea chapter 4. It's verse 15. It says, though you are a whore, Yasharel, let not Yehuda become guilty. Do not come up to Gilgal, nor go up to Bethel, nor swear an oath, saying, As Yahuwah liveth. So here is, it's just a warning not to swear an oath that says, you know, as, as long as Yah lives, this or that will happen. Um, and that's basically the same sentiment that we're going to get here in a bit when we get to the, the New Testament stuff about it. But first, let's take a look at there's some more places it's mentioned in the Tanakh. This is from Ecclesiastes chapter 5. It says, Guard your steps when you go to the house of Elohim, and draw near to listen rather than to give the slaughtering of fools. And what is that? For they do not know that they do evil. Do not be hastily hasty with your mouth, and let not your heart hurry to bring forth a word before Elohim. For Elohim is in the heavens, and you on earth. Therefore let your words be few. For a dream comes through the greatness of the task, and a fool's voice is known by his many words. When you make a vow to Elohim, do not delay to pay it, for he takes no pleasure in fools. Pay that which you have vowed, for it's better not to vow than to vow and not pay. 
Do not allow your mouth to cause your flesh to sin, nor say before the messenger of Elohim that it was a mistake. Why should Elohim be wroth at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For inasmuch dreaming and many words there is futility, but fear Elohim. And I think, you know, just to bring a little clarity to this, he says, you know, be careful when you're in the house of Elohim or when you're at your Shabbat service and you're with all your, your people. You know, if something comes up and they say, hey, you know, let's take volunteers for this or that. And you go in and raise your hand and say, yeah, yeah, I'll show up. I'll do it because, because in your, you're hasty with your mouth and, and you've let your heart hurry to bring forth a word before Elohim. You're thinking, well, this is really important and I'm here for Shabbat and I just want to make sure that everyone knows that I'm here to participate and I'm fully into this thing. And so they may ask for something that you really, if you were not, you know, in the house and you weren't, you know, trying to sort of impress people, you might not sign up for it. And he says it's better not to go ahead and say, yes, I'll do it and then not do it. That It would be better not to at all. See, for a dream comes through the greatness of the task and a fool's voice is known by his many words. The people make promises that they, they, they can't come through with. And I'm sure it happens, you know, that people want to volunteer for something, but then when they actually comes to the day of, they realize, well, they've got this other thing that's important or whatever. And I think this is a warning just to not let yourself get wrapped up in the moment and make, because, you know, just to have that respect for Elohim and the fact that if you, if you, if you say it among your brethren in your, in your congregation, that there's an, an extra level of, you know, importance there that you need to have respect for. And just to be careful that you don't let your heart, you know, you know, don't make any promises that you really can't keep, I guess is what I'm getting at. Do not allow your mouth to cause your flesh to sin, nor say before the messenger of Elohim that it was a mistake. Why should Elohim be wroth at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For in much dreaming and many words there is futility. So anyway, then in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, there's also, a, it says... In verse 2, it is the same for all, one event to the righteousness and to the wrong, to the good and to the clean and to the unclean, and to the one slaughtering and to the one not slaughtering. As is the good one, so is the sinner, the one swearing as the one fearing an oath. It mentions it there, so I figured I would read it. I, don't, I think it's just more um, reinforcement, you know, that it is important what you say. And let's, let's hear the two times that our Messiah speaks about it. From Matthew chapter 5, verse uh, 33 through 37 says, Again, you heard that it was said of those of old. Now, whenever he says, <clears throat> whenever the Messiah says, you've heard that it was said of old, this, is, this means he's going to tell you what's going around saying it's the law when really it's the, what they've kind of twisted it to say. You know, when he says, it is written, that's when you know that he's telling you what's actually written in, in Moses' Pentateuch. But when he says, you've heard what is said, that means this is what you guys are going around saying but isn't correct. <laughs> he says, again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to Yah. So, see, it was kind of a, a, a combination between the uh, the Deuteronomy verse and the Leviticus verse. So this one says, Fear Yah your Elohim and serve him and swear by his name. And this one says, Do not swear falsely by my name and so profane the name of your Elohim. So he says, Y'all didn't get it right. Those are what the scripture says. This is what's going around though. What's going around is, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to Yah. But I say to you, Do not swear at all. Neither by the heaven, because it's Elohim's throne, nor by the earth, for it's his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor swear by your head, because you're not able to make one hair white or black, but let your word yes be yes, and your no be no, and what goes beyond these is from the wicked one. And so, I think he's making it clear here that a couple of things. Number one, he's forbidding you to swear on these things anything in heaven so don't swear by heaven the throne in heaven don't swear by the temple anything in earth 
Don't swear by your own head. Don't swear by a city. He's saying just, and, and you know, I think the main sentiment here is just to, you know, be a trustworthy person so that when you say something, people know that it's going to get taken care of. Let your yes be yes. Let your word be bond so that when when you say you're going to take care of something or that you're going to do something in the future, there's no need for you to swear on the, you know, the temple or, or swear on the name of Yah or anything like that. And he goes on and expounds some more later in chapter 23 of Matthew and says, Woe to you, blind guides. This is when he's, um, you know, calling out the Pharisees and Sadducees. And he says, Whoever swears by the dwelling place, could this is what, so this is what they were saying. This is, Woe to you, blind guides, who say these things. These are what they're saying. Whoever swears by the dwelling place, it doesn't matter, but whoever swears by the gold of the dwelling place is bound by an oath. You fools, are you not blind? For which is greater, the gold or the dwelling place that sets the gold apart, right? Because if it's the being in the temple is what makes the gold holy, then which is greater? Duh. And whosoever swears by the slaughter, slaughter place, it doesn't matter. But whoever swears by the gift that's on it is bound by the oath. You fools and blind, for which is greater, the gift or the slaughtering place that sets the gift apart and makes it holy? Obviously, it's the, the slaughtering place. He then, who swears by the slaughter place, swears by it and by all that was upon it, and he who swears by the dwelling place or the temple, swears by it and by him who is dwelling in it. And he who swears by the heaven swears by the throne of Elohim and him who is sitting upon it. So he's saying, do you swear by anything that has Yah's name on it? That's just as good as swearing by his name. And then you'll be, you'll come under the judgment of these two, these three laws up here. But now what I would like to look at is because here later in James, we get another warning from him echoing what was in chapter five of Matthew. He says, but above all my brothers do not swear either by heaven or by the earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, lest you fall into judgment. He says above all, this is at the very end of James at the very end of his long letter, he finally, you know, at the end of chapter 5, he says, above all. So for him, this is one of the most important things. Above all, do not swear. And I believe that part of it was because of this synagogue of Satan. These, mystery, these Kabbalah following Babylonian mystics who had snuck in to the priesthood. And, uh, and what we're going to look at next is some of the different places where you might have to take an oath. And some of the different things that these people get into that, you know, when you first get into some of these like fraternities, it seems innocent. But once you get further up the rankings, you, things begin to you begin to realize many things are wrong here. And, um, you know, whether you want to admit it or not, the Catholic Church is really a lot of evil people from the top down over there. And. Uh, we can get some interesting stuff here from the the, bith, the the oath of the Catholic bishop I'd like to read first. It says, I, so-and-so, elect of the Church of Rome, I'm guessing, from henceforth will be faithful and obedient to St. Peter the Apostle, to the Holy Roman Church, to our Lord, the Lord, whoever the Pope at the time is, you put their name in there, and to his successors, canonically entering. I will neither advise, consent, nor do anything that they may lose life or member, or that their persons may be seized, or hands anywise laid upon them, or any injury offered to them under any pretense whatsoever. So first thing they do is swear that nothing you do is going to get the people ranked higher than you in physical danger or trouble. So first of all, look out for your superiors. Don't, don't worry about doing the right thing. Then it says, the counsel with which they shall entrust me by themselves their messengers or letters I will not knowingly reveal to any of their prejudice I will help them keep and defend the Roman papacy and the regalties of St. Peter saving my order against all men the legate of the apostolic see going and coming I will honorably treat and help in his necessities the rights honors privileges and authority of the Holy Roman Church of our Lord the Pope and his aforesaid successors and will endeavor to preserve, defend, increase, and advance. So I'm not going to read all of these, but if the Messiah and James and the Torah all say don't swear an oath, 
what are these people doing having it to where you have to swear in an oath to get into their priesthood? Well, I mean, I'll tell you what they're doing. They're evil. They have no concern with what the scripture says to do or don't do. They do what they want and make the scripture try to match up with their own doctrines. Um, so we're going to move on from the bishop's oath here and take a look at some excerpts from the Masonic oaths that you have to take to be a Mason. This one says, <laughs> okay, sorry, I was trying to figure out where to, to jump in here. Let's just read this excerpt here. It says, this is for the Master Mason's Oath. It says, I furthermore promise and swear that I will relieve all poor and indigent brethren as far as necessity requires and my ability will permit. I furthermore promise and swear that I will obey all true signs, tokens, and summonries sent me by the hand of the fellow, fellow craft or from the door of a just and regular fellow craft's lodge is if within the length of my cable toe. All this is I solemnly and sincerely swear with a full and hearty resolution to perform the same without any evasion, equivocation, or mental reservation under no less penalty than to have my heart taken from under my naked left breast and carried to the valley of Jehoshaphat, there to be thrown into the field to become prey to the wolves of the desert. So they swear to keep secrets of their brothers and uh, other Masons and do anything that another Mason bids you to do or you'll get your heart ripped out or whatever. And this one goes on, but uh, this, and I, I don't, there's these things are, I don't want to spend the whole time reading these oaths because quite frankly, they're evil, but there's just some excerpts here. I mean, to the, to these guys, that if we, if it's forbidden to go and, and swear in by oaths and use these oaths and they go into this degree to make you to swear into these oaths to be able to get into their their fraternities you just you know they're evil um this one says i you know whoever of my own free will and accord to the in the presence of the almighty god and this worshipful lodge erect to him and dedicate the holy saint john do hereby and heroine most solemnly and sincerely promise and swear that i will hail ever conceal and never reveal any of the secrets arts parts or points of points of the master mason's degree any person or person whomsoever so you have to be a secret about anything later it says i will acknowledge and obey all due signs and summons sent to me from a master mason's lodge i will keep a worthy brother master mason's secrets inevitably i will not aid nor be present at the initiation passing or raising of a woman an old man a young man in his knowledge, an atheist, a madman, a fool, knowing them to be such. I will not cheat, wrong, nor defraud a master mason's lodge, nor a brother of this degree, knowingly, nor supplant him in any of his laudable undertakings, but will give him due and timely notice that he may ward off any danger. Then these are some of the punishments. This Somebody's gone in and just pulled the punishments out of there. For if you break the oath, this is what happens to you binding myself under no less penalty that having throat cut from ear to ear my tongue torn out by its roots my body buried in the rough sands of the sea a cable length from the shore where the tide now another thing i want to say is i'm just getting this information free off the internet from the sources that i can find if some of this stuff is inaccurate you know i don't really care i mean we all know these what these people are up to anyways you know if if some of this stuff is slightly off you know i apologize i don't claim to be uh an expert on secret societies and stuff I do know what they're all about and what they've got their fingers into and I, I can I can look and see where our country has been shaped and by these people but yet they choose to keep themselves and what they do secret because you, you never learn about Freemasons in history class but yet these guys pretty much formed our country so it goes on, uh, the next degree up, if it wasn't bad enough to have your throat cut and your tongue torn out and your body burned, buried in the rough sands of the sea, the next penalty is have your left breast torn open, your heart plucked out, and giving the beasts of the field the fowls of the air. So then, And then the next one is to have your body severed in twain, bowels taken out and burned to ashes, and the ashes scattered in the four winds of the heaven. And then if you get up to be a Shriner, they say, in willful violation, wherefore may I incur the fearful penalty of having my eyeballs pierced to through the center, 
with a three-edged blade. My feet flayed and forced to walk the hot sands upon the sterile shores of the Red Sea until the flaming sun shall strike with a livid plague, and many and may Allah, the God of Arab, Muslim, and Mohammedan, the God of our fathers, support me. So once you get up to the Shriners, they start to let you know that you're really not worshiping the God you think you're worshiping. And if you listen to Albert Pike, um, their God is Lucifer. They're Luciferic. Um, let's let's read a little bit of this Jesuit oath. The Jesuits are like the the um, the secret strong arm behind the, the Pope. They're like his henchmen. It says I now, in the presence of the Almighty God and the Blessed Virgin Virgin Mary, the Blessed Michael the Archangel, and the Blessed Saint John the Baptist, and my ghostly father. Weird how they put it, my ghostly father. The Superior General of the Society of Jesus, founded by Ignatius Loyola, and he's a real piece of work. He like went in some cave and got a demon to talk to him, and this demon like inspired him to write their official early writings and stuff. It's it's a story. The Superior General of the Society of Jesus, yeah, founded by yes, do by the womb of the Virgin swear that His Holiness the Pope is Christ. Vice Regent and the true and holy head of the Catholic Universal Church, I do now renounce and disown any allegiance due to any heretical king, prince, or state, name Protestant or liberal, or obedience to any of their laws or magistrates or officers. I do further declare the doctrines of the Church of England, Scotland, and of Calvinists, Huguenots, and others, the name of the Protestant or liberal, to be damnable, and themselves to be damned, who will not forsake the same. I do further promise and declare that, notwithstanding, I am dispensed with to assume my religious my religion heretical for the propagation of Mother Church interest to keep secret and private all her agents councils from time to time as they interest me. I will, when opportunity presents, make and wage relentless war secretly or openly against all heretics, Protestants, liberals, as I am directed to extirpate them from the face of the earth and that I will spare neither age, sex, condition, or condition and that I will hang, burn, waste, boil, flay, strangle, and bury alive those infamous heretics, rip up the stomachs and wombs of the woman and crush their infant's head against the wall in order to annihilate their execrable race. <laughs> wow. And, you know, obviously they've, they've changed it up. This is from back in 1916, but it's the same people behind the scenes running the thing. This is another excerpt from it. I further prom furthermore promise and declare that I will when openly present and make wage. Yeah, this is yeah, the same. And if the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly in use the poison cup, the strangula strangulation cord, the steel of the parlyard or the laden bullet, regardless of the honor, rank, or dignity, or authority of the person or persons, whatever may be their condition in life, either public or private, as I at any time may be directed to do so by any agent of the Pope or superior of the Brotherhood of the Holy Faith, the Society of Jesus. The original Hippocratic Oath, I thought it was interesting. They used to swear by Apollo, the physician, and and it's hard to read here, but there's some other Greek gods here that are mentioned, and I thought that was interesting how to be a doctor. And a lot of the doctors do have to take oaths too. And, you know, that's just the point that I thought that I've never really seen someone cover when you cover that section in Matthew about let your yes be yes, is the fact that, you know, it says don't swear an oath, but many of the things that you have to swear an oath to get into, these fraternities, these secret societies, they're things that you wouldn't want to be in. So I believe that, you know, Messiah was foreknowing enough to throw that in there and to be adamant about it as far as also with James so that you know, if you know your scripture well and you get ready to join one of these like Masonic orders or something and you realize, hey, wait a minute, these guys are making me swear an oath. And when you really take a look at that oath and compare it with what your Bible says, it's, it's, it's not good. It's, it's telling you to commit sins. You know, every single one of those oaths, the main thing it said was that you promised to bear false witness to protect your brethren. And bearing false witness is a sin. That's one of the big ten. So for you to swear that you're willing to sin to to break the 
the man upstairs to break the real rules in order to be a member of this fraternal, fraternal order, <clears throat> that's when you should know right off the bat that it's not good. And uh, anyway, that's all I have for this teaching. I hope you guys got something out of it. Um, as always, like and subscribe. Leave a comment. Let me know what you think. I'll see you guys next time.